Boss, understanding quantum theory is a necessity to understand what reality is composed of. And I've talked to many scientists, uh, physicists, uh, and cosmologists, and everybody sort of describes it, and I sort of understand it, and then I think about it, and uh, I'm not sure really what it is. It, it, it seems so uh, mysterious. Mm. <laughs> Well, it had a great impact because it actually broke concepts that had been held so, so fundamentally, so centrally. Um, if at the end of the 19th century you had asked a scientist, when is a the scientific theory complete? When would it have been really made complete? He would say, well, when it has a deterministic account of what's happening. Mm. And then quantum mechanics comes along and it seems that we have to give up this ideal for science, that it should come up with a deterministic account of what we, what we observe, what, what, what's happening in the observable world. And um, one was a great philosopher that is one of my heroes, Hans Reichenbach, who was one of Einstein's associates in Berlin. He was writing about that. He said, all right, but if the world is not deterministic, there must surely be some sort of structure to it, some sort of constraint. And uh, he suggested that in quantum mechanics, they would still be able to say that all correlations between phenomena have a common cause. They always can be traced back to a common cause. So, for example, if you find pollution at two different places, mm -hmm. but at the same height, the same, the same level, the same time, you say we trace it back to a common source. Mm -hmm. Now, in quantum mechanics, they study these correlations between the behavior of particles that are very far apart from mm -hmm, each other, mm -hmm. if they're generated together. There must be a common cause. And uh, it turns out that in quantum mechanics, that is violated too. That um, the correlations, they are, as it were, it's like a kind of global choreography. <laughs> and that completely breaks the conceptions of modern science. So that's why it's very important to understand this, to see how new, what a, what a new kind of theory this was, that it was really went against what the scientists had really believed in before. Now, is this something, as it appears to us because of our measurements and the only way we can yeah. test this because it's so tiny and difficult to assess, or is it something that's absolutely buried in the reality that's fundamental, uh, or alternatively, another possibility is, is, is there something beneath the, the, the indeterminacy of, of the quantum theory that at some deeper level that we don't know yet has a, 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 a more deterministic level? Is there any way mm -hmm. that we can sort through this? Uh, yes, I think by now we can. I think that after about 50 years of studying those very questions, I think now we understand that. Um, well, I don't understand it, so help me. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, it is definitely these effects are definitely manifested on the observable level. Right. Um, it took a long time to really realize the kind of experiments that had to be done. But in the 1980s, the group uh, Aspect and his people, they were able to actually have experiments in which you could isolate definite numbers of photons. And um, they were showing that there what's called the Bell inequalities are violated. Mm -hmm. you know, this came from the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. In the 60s, John Bell proved this theorem that um, if there was going to be any kind of traditional theory that would work here, certain inequalities would have to hold, the Bell inequalities. Quantum mechanics violates them. And that's what I was saying about there's no common cause that the theory gives you, right? So in the 1980s, they started doing these experiments in the way that really was telling, that you couldn't get around it anymore. You could see that this was a fact that you, it's on the observable level. The, um, the, the, the counters that were, you know, charting the correlations, okay. they were 10 meters apart in mm -hmm. the first experiments. Mm -hmm. That's a long way. Now they can do it at much greater distances. Right? Now, yes, from the very beginning, there was the question whether maybe there could be some deterministic underpinnings at some unobservable level. Mm -hmm. Hidden variables. Hidden variables, exactly. First of all, von Neumann, I gave a proof that there couldn't be, but his proof had assumptions, okay? Um, Bell, Bell's uh, theorem was very important because it ruled out a whole lot of other possible deterministic mechanisms, right? 
um, there is still always a possibility of something, you know, really, what should I say, Baroque, right? That violates many, many assumptions. Um, it, it, that is a kind of what you might call determinism without causality. And this was made famous by Bohm, Bohm's theory, because it's deterministic, but uh, the causal models don't apply, okay? <laughs> um, so, yes, you can always have intellectual inventions of that sort that will get you something like this. Uh, Wigner, in a famous commentary um, uh, on Everett, uh, pointed out that if you were willing to have infinitely many, an infinite variety of hidden variables, you could fit anything. See? So, it's not surprising to me that scientists don't take this seriously. Uh, they don't take seriously these kinds of uh, underpinnings, deterministic underpinnings. Um, what is um, what is marvelous, magical, is that there should be a theory that doesn't allow anything better. <laughs> okay? And um, but you know, I'm talking about is in, in an empiricist way because I'm talking about how the observable phenomena don't fit the old-fashioned causal models. See, I'm not talking about. That's it's astonishing, in a sense. Yes, it is. That is the most astonishing thing. So, so what does it tell us about the nature of our reality? I think all that it tells us is that the concepts we had don't fit. And then, of course, in science, in science they will change the concepts. I would say that the, the transition from classical physics to quantum physics was a radical conversion. It was a case where the ordinary way of designing your projects led you into a, into a cul-de-sac and that the concepts had to be broken and changed and that's what was done. That was done by the physicists. So all of this occurs, of course, at the micro level, the subatomic level, the atomic level, uh, but are there any implications for the macro world or does all mm. this combine and the wave function collapses and all the metaphors that we, <laughs> we hear about. And so what exists there, yes, we need that, but it really doesn't affect the macro world. Oh, no, it does. It does. Now, the experiments that I told you about, they don't yet show macro interference. But um, Anthony Leggett, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, but not for this particular subject, he's been designing experiments that could, be, that could show these kinds of interference effects, the non-classical effects on the macro level. And um, this is becoming an important subject. Um, quantum information theory, mm -hmm. quantum cryptography, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they try to exploit these sure. very effects, these very, you know, correlations that don't have common causes. Um, it's coming very close to us. So as a philosopher of science who has looked for a long time at the whole enterprise of science, mm. how um, significant do you place quantum theory in our understanding of reality? Well, you know, you won't be surprised to hear that I, I think it has great support for the empiricist tradition, that um, it's a place where what the really important changes have to do with the observational level, with observational effects that could not be fitted into anything old-fashioned. Now, it's true that there are still people, of course, uh, who are developing metaphysical theories that try to accommodate this. But for me, the great value of this science is that it refuted so much metaphysics. <laughs> and I think that uh, really it, it gives a, an impetus to the idea that we shouldn't do metaphysics. We should understand physics as a discipline that addresses the observable, the observable world that we live in.